So um, I will share, um, no, sorry, I think uh, I have to switch, probably I have to switch sound here. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, that's great. Uh, so uh, I want to share some data set with you and uh, tell you a story that uh, is uh, that produced this data set. Uh, in just a second, I will send it uh, via Telegram. Uh, so I sent uh, via Telegram data set color score CSV. And first of all, I ask you to open it in R and let us look at this data set. I have to upload it to my RStudio Cloud so um, to be able to access it. Uh, probably. Uh, so this is working and uh, now uh, the story behind this data set. Uh, actually, uh, several years ago, um, one of my colleagues uh, uh, asked uh, himself uh, the following question. Is it true that uh, different color of uh, a paper sheet uh, where people write their exam, uh, uh, exam answers? Uh, affects the result of exam. Is it true, for example, that it is better to write exam on, uh, for example, orange uh, paper because uh, orange makes people more excited, more active, and it increases their um, uh, their cognitive abilities. Or probably it is quite opposite, and probably it is better to write on something very calm, like light blue. Uh, because it makes uh, it makes you more calm and 
decrease uh, anxiety and so you uh, you write uh, your exam better. So uh, is it true that um, that uh, different color of paper sheets affect the score result? And uh, actually, uh, uh, my colleague uh, conducted an experiment. Uh, he had a rather large group, I think, um, I don't remember, you can actually you can count uh, rows in this data set and say how many uh, students uh, there were, I think 200 or so. And um, yeah, then he, uh, uh, he assigned it color randomly to each student and uh, he gave uh, a paper with with this color. And uh, then he tried to compare the results. Of course, uh, variants are the same and uh, everything is random and, and actually colors uh, are randomized. Uh, so we can expect uh, that uh, the, only, the only difference that we see in the result can be explained actually by two, by, by two things, either by pure randomness in this process or by systematic effect of uh, color. And so he conducted the, the, this experiment and uh, then he did some statistical testing. And after that, he came to me to discuss the results. And uh, let us do the same. Uh, actually, uh, actually uh, first of all, I ask you to, uh, to do this. So you have, you have a clear research question. Is it true that different color produce different exam scores? And you have a data set with the result. Actually, only two columns of the original data set are preserved, but these are only two columns that we actually need. Uh, color and um, exam score. And uh, so I ask you, uh, can you conduct a research and tell me, is it true that it is better to use one color than another? You can try to do it. Uh, so let us look at uh, the data set. Okay, we have 263 observations. So we have 263 students. Okay, we have the first problem. Uh, this is not actually a comma separated values. Uh, this is semicolon separated values. Uh, can you solve this problem? Can you read this semicolon separated value file? I believe there should be function read lean. Yeah, and we have So this is this is what we need. This is the result. Uh, 
I think I have to increase font because otherwise it is not very visible on the screen. Is there a difference uh, of uh, using with uh, CSV or uh, TSV? Uh, TSV is separated values. Uh, and uh, CSV is common separate values. I'm not sure if if R allows you to uh, it allows it allows us to use okay this this this, this it also works. Read CSV also works if you provide this uh, sep option. Uh, actually, TSV is uh, a similar thing, but by default uh, it uses uh, tabulation as a separator. So uh, just CSV no, no, we, uh, we can uh, we can use this common. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look through all the data, uh, you see that there are some problem because uh, for some people in their score column, uh, there is a string apps. Uh, actually, I just um, he kept uh, 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 this string from the original data set and EPS just means uh, absent. And uh, so we don't have any score from uh, these people. And uh, also we have a different problem. In, in fact, if I want to look For example, I can look through the score column and uh, I want to uh, the first problem actually is that uh, if I try to look at my variables, I see that both of them color and score is character. This is because the strings like apps and uh, this is not what uh, I'm interested in. I'm interested in only numeric values. And so we can get rid of this, uh, this uh, non-numeric values. Uh, for example, I can just uh, look through my score and I can select everything that is not uh, that is not apps just to begin with. I also thought yes, one hundred twenty five and twenty observation number twenty. Uh, yes, we have another word. Uh, this is uh, this is communications. Uh, it means that uh, this person uh, have been removed uh, due to communication. And uh, so we have to think what to do with these observations because um, basically we have several options. We can exclude them or we can just put zeros there. I don't know what what do you prefer? What is better? How do you think? So if uh, if a student was removed uh, from the exam due to cheating, uh, should we should we just put zero? As we, we shouldn't put zero because if we put zero, it's like we assume that uh, color Mm -hmm. so yeah, something like this. Yeah, at least it will be. At least this this effect is. Well, prob probably it uh, probably it can work like this because probably if we believe that color have uh, effect on uh, on the result, then we probably uh, assume that color have effect on uh, how people perceive the. Uh, difficulty of the exam. 
And in this case, we can assume that if, uh, if a student uh, uh, sees that uh, the exam is difficult, then uh, he or she have more incentive to communicate with each other to cheat. But probably it is too, uh, too far-fetched. Probably we are better to remove this, uh, this uh, roles as well. Okay, so let us remove it. So our first, our first goal is to remove. Okay, let me use our notebook. Um, so uh, your first task is to prepare data set so it can be analyzed. So this uh, this column uh, that is related to score should be a numeric and everything everything that is not numeric, uh, basically I, I believe there are only apps and communicate uh, strings should be removed. Uh, if you wish, uh, uh, this is this is if it is if it is conven uh, convenient for you. I just I just will use our notebook because I want to keep uh, keep the recording in some way. So, our sport CSV. In fact, uh, one way uh, to remove everything that is not numeric uh, is uh, the following. We can, uh, first of all, let us look, are there any uh, missings, any an A in our score uh, column? This can be done by function is an A. For example, I want to look at any uh, at any rows uh, for which we have an NA. Uh, I see no rows. So in, in uh, that score, we don't have any, uh, any missing, any values that, that do not present. But uh, I can try to convert the score to numeric value. Numeric. And then uh, you see there is a warning that an A is introduced by coercion. Uh, that means that uh, some values uh, cannot be converted to uh, numeric. And they are probably a corresponds to these strings. Okay, I can probably increase my font even more, but it is really not very much space on the screen. No, this is better. And now uh, to be sure that we didn't remove anything uh, important. We can remove. Uh, we can look at uh, this. Oh, uh, let me ask you to do it. Uh, look at uh, the roles that cannot be converted to numeric. If I try to convert it to numeric, all non-numeric strings are converted to NA. So, uh, and uh, then uh, I want to look at the rows in the in the original data set um, that produces this NA's 
with the SS numeric conversion. I just want to make sure that I didn't miss anything important in my data. So can you do it? Well, it's too complicated. Actually, we have everything uh, that we need already in this uh, in this thing. Because uh, if you do this, uh, if you do this as numeric, you have this vector, and values of this vector are either are in the numbers or at this. And then you can use syntax, which is very close to this one, to select in your original data frame only those rows uh, that corresponds to an A's here. Okay, you just can uh, you just can edit this this one and it will work. Oh, are there any other strings in our data that are not uh, apps and not communications? Not communicates. Oh, um, yes. Sorry. Just... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's fine. So uh, nothing more. Actually, we can, we can uh, ask R to show our uh, as unique uh, values in this vector with unique comments. So you can you can prepend unique, um, and uh, you can see just without manual inspection, you can see all all all, um, mm -hmm. uh, all unique values in this in this vector. Just, just in Anybody found anything else, any other strings? In fact, when I prepared this data frame, my first thing was uh, to remove these rows uh, at the beginning. But then I, I thought, why, why should I do that? This is real data, and this is actually what we do every every day when we uh, when we when we do our data analysis. So this is just a lie. Uh, so we can um, let us look at. This thing. And we see this apps and communicatsa, but to, to make sure that uh, we don't have anything else, we have to look through the whole the whole result, but we can avoid this uh, by using unique function. Oh, I can just do it like this. I'm interested in unique values of score. And we see that the only unique values are absent communications or nothing else. Um, which 
Yes, yes, yes. Um, because uh, you probably are trying to find unique roles. Mm -hmm. And we are interested now only in unique values of this variable. So we see that nothing is missed. So let us just uh, keep it in this way. So um, I can just do it like this. Um, I'm not sure that this is simplest way to, to do it, but at least it works. It should work. No, it doesn't work because I forgot as usual. No, it doesn't work either. Yes, we can. I just don't remember how to use it right now. Ah. Okay. This this thing works, and now. Uh, Okay, I tried to use uh, not. I tried to use syntax from Python. Okay, this thing works. So uh, this is I just uh, I just say that I want uh, those roles who uh, do not satisfy this condition. So who is that, that is not known. This is this is inversion not. And let us put it to dot. And this is this is a data set we are interested in now. Uh, there is also some uh, columns that does not make any sense for us, so we can actually remove them. We can put it here, probably like this. Now we have only color and scope. Excuse me, and how many observations now do we have? Mm, let us check. Uh, actually, uh, this thing gives us that we have 239 rows. Or we can use this function enroll to get the value. So uh, we had this very short data cleaning that took us just a half an hour. Uh, there is a joke uh, I read uh, once on Twitter uh, that data science uh, consists of 90% uh, uh, of data cleaning, 10% uh, uh, of um, making statistical tests and fitting models, and 90% uh, of interpretation of these results. So, so let us use uh, some statistical tools and uh, give me an answer, please. The tool that our button, and we conclude that color effects score. Thank you. 
Yes, yes. So you can visualize data, you can do statistical tests, and you can find some values, some, anything that you want to. Let us take, for example, five minutes. And after five minutes, let us discuss the results.
So if you have any conclusions, let me know. Do you have answer to this question? Mm -hmm. no, no, no. no, no, I see, I see. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, uh, I will show in a second how to find the new which color, but currently you can just, for example, do it by hands because you have only four colors in this data set. So you can you can find you can if you, you can find a subset of each color. Not not very uh, not very elegant, but it will work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Paulina made the box plot, and we can we also can do uh, this box plot. Uh, we can just use box plot, and we are interested in score as a function of color. And uh, we see some results, some distribution uh, that relates to every color. Okay, we have five colors, blue, orange, purple, white, yellow. And uh, we see that, for example, median score for blue is slightly worse than other colors, but they are pretty close to each other, but but probably probably there is some effect. You see that this blue color is much less than else. Probably we can test it in some way. Yes. Mm, sorry. Um, but we can compare blue with something else. Probably, probably we have some results on that. Blue is something else. I'm not sure that yellow is the best. 
So, did anybody find any difference that um, that allows us to conclude that we have some difference between colors in terms of score? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, probably we can just find uh, the corresponding means. And uh, of course, we can do it just uh, by hand by selecting uh, subsets, but uh, let me use uh, the appropriate function from tidyverse from DPU wow, uh, library. I don't have Tidyverse yet here. Let me install it. And um, I suggest you installing this Tidyverse package if it is not installed. Now we can turn it on. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will discuss uh, t tests uh, after after a second. Uh, so uh, this is actually a typical uh, a typical situation when you have uh, two columns and you want to find, uh, for example, average uh, of some value for each uh, value of some other variable. Like here, I want, uh, I want to draw, uh, I, I want to find an average uh, score for each color. And uh, this can be done using uh, this uh, syntax. Uh, I use uh, here various uh, features of Tidyverse. Uh, first of all, these things are pipes. I'm not sure. Uh, did Ivan uh, tell you about these pipes? Probably not. Yes, we, we discussed these things. Okay. Uh, and then I do grouping by color. And so basically, uh, at this point, R just creates several, several virtual tables for each color. And then uh, I use this function summarize to get a summary of each table. So uh, I have different tables for each color. And then uh, for each table, I calculate 
mean of variable score and record it as a new variable score. And this is what we have here. Oh. So uh, what do you want to uh, now we we previously discussed only t test and uh, t test allows you to compare two groups and here we have five groups so what should we compare what do you want to, what do you want to compare if you are if if you want to find uh, find the result find significant result find significant difference Uh, we can uh, we can have something like a base color like white and we compare it with uh, all other yes but probably um, it is possible the difference between uh, between white color and um, for example uh, you see that this white color it is somewhere in between and uh, it, it is possible that uh, you have non-significant difference, for example, between white color and uh, blue on one hand, and you have non-significant difference between white color and uh, this purple on other hand, but difference between purple and blue is much larger. So it can become significant. Uh, so which colors you want to compare? Blue and orange. Okay, let us let us compare blue and orange. Now I can extract uh, samples that corresponds to blue and orange. Uh, color blue. Okay, let me introduce uh, another way to filter data. Uh, we can just use a diverse filter, color blue. I'm sorry, it's B, no. it's, it's just B. Mm -hmm. uh, and Okay, I want score, and this is blue score. Okay, blue and and what and orange, right? And now, now we can use the test. And we have this value. Um, how would you interpret this t test? Do we see significant difference between blue score and orange score? Mm -hmm. So p value is less than five uh, percent. Uh, it is actually is less than two percent. Uh, it, it, it is it is quite small. Uh, for alpha five percent, yes, at uh, the usual significant uh, significance level of five percent, we have we have some result statistically significant. Um, are there any objections?
Uh, yes, it is two-sided by default. Yes, no problem here. Uh, we didn't have any appropriate uh, hypothesis that one is better than another, and we used and we used uh, two-sided t-test. Yes, uh, two difference uh, in means is not equal to zero. Okay, and so other objections. Uh, actually, actually, we we were interested in the question: uh, Is it true that color can affect uh, the score? And it means that any difference, uh, any difference will, will, will suffice uh, to give us positive answer. So, if we see that there is a difference between blue and orange, then yes. Color affects the score. Okay, anybody objections? Okay. In fact, uh, this is a textbook example uh, of uh, some problem in uh, this uh, application of uh, t-tests and other statistical tests. And um, let me assume that instead of choosing uh, two different, uh, two, instead of choosing two colors with the largest difference, as I did, Instead that, uh, uh, instead of that, you know, assume that I do the following. I just uh, get, um, okay, I have, I have five colors. So I have uh, 10 color pairs and uh, there is uh, one, two, three, four, five students here in the class and, uh, and I believe, eight students are uh, in Zoom. So I can uh, ask each student to compare their own pay. Yeah. For example, I can ask you, what is your name? Uh, I can ask Nastya to compare blue and uh, purple. And what is your name? Kirill. And uh, I can ask uh, Kirill to compare orange with uh, white and so on. So everybody of you uh, would have uh, their own problem, their own comparison, their own test. And then um, some of you uh, will give me that you found, uh, you found significant result. Basically, it will be a person of all uh, is lucky enough uh, to get this pair between blue and orange. Probably somebody else, but if uh, if there is a person with blue and orange pair, uh, then this person will report that, wow, I see the difference. This is, difference is significant, right? On the other hand, uh, we discussed that everything that we do uh, is of some probabilistic nature. And each, uh, each student uh, can make a mistake. Actually, the result of each student uh, can be uh, the result that is just uh, due to chance, due to some sampling error. And we know that the result of one comparison, uh, the probability that uh, we have false positive result in one comparison is 5%. But now we don't have one comparison. We don't have one study. We have several mini studies. Yes. Something, something like that. In fact, uh, what's the problem? The problem is uh, the probability of that one person make a mistake is 5%. But the probability that 
one of 10 persons make a mistake is much larger. Actually, we can, we can calculate it. It is, uh, it is a good exercise in probability theory to calculate the probability uh, to make a mistake. But um, roughly, it is 10 times high. It is, very, it is a rather rough uh, estimate, but it is something like this. But in, uh, in, in any case, uh, I think you believe me that probability that one person is mistaken if we do experiment in this in this scheme is larger than probability uh, the, the, than the probability that at least one person is mistaken is larger than five percent. Okay, everybody everybody understand uh, this problem. So if we do something that can give us mistake with some probability several times, more or less independently. We increase probability of mistake, and we have to account for it. And actually, this this was a question my colleague approached me several years ago. He he uh, showed me this data, and uh, then he said, "Okay, I see that there is a difference between blue and orange, and it is significant. Is it correct?" And I said, "Oh." That's the time to discuss uh, analysis of variances and uh, multiple comparison problem, because it is really a textbook example of this problem. So uh, the next question is what to do, and uh, indeed we have uh, we have different ways to overcome this issue. And uh, one uh, one way is uh, just to divide our alpha by 10, as Nasta suggested. And uh, before Nasta, it was another researcher who suggested it. Sorry, Nasta, you are not the first. Uh, this is called Bonferroni correction. And in Bonferroni correction, you can do one of two, of two equivalent ways. Either you divide your uh, significance level by number of comparisons, or vice versa, you multiply your p-value by number of comparisons. Uh, and this is actually a brute force. Uh, I mean that it will work, it will give you a reliable result, but it probably can be a bit too conser conservative. Uh, because in fact, uh, it, well, it is, it is just, just a first approximation to the correction that we have to do. Uh, but for some other, um, problems, we have specialized methods that take into account this problem. And actually, uh, we have a specialized method that allows one to compare uh, to compare several groups, not two groups as in t-test, but several groups. And uh, to answer the question, is it true that there is uh, some difference between any of these groups? And uh, this method is called uh, analysis of variance, or ANOVA in English, uh, or statistical uh, or dispersion analysis in Russian. And it's ANOVA. Uh, and let me explain briefly how uh, this novel works. So I will switch to the whiteboard.
Okay, yeah. let me assume that now I have several groups. And uh, I will draw a picture that is uh, similar to the box plot uh, that we uh, saw at the beginning. Uh, so, for example, we have different, different colors and we have scores for each color. So this is score, and this is for example orange, blue, white, and uh, we have some data points. For example, something like this. And uh, I'm interested uh, in the following values. I'm interested in uh, so-called in-group variance. So for each group, for each category, uh, I find the variance of the corresponding variable. Uh, so I have in-group variance. Uh, it is like mean of uh, variances in each group. And uh, then uh, I have another value that is called uh, between group variance. Uh, between group variants is uh, the following thing. Uh, let me find an average in each group. So I will I will have average here, average here, and average here. And let me assume that now I have uh, a data set that consists only of three numbers. This value, this value, and this value. And I can find uh, variance of this data set. So uh, this variance will measure how different are these sample means. So this is called between group variance. Uh, this is uh, variance between means. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm not writing exact formulas and uh, to make these um, definitions correct, uh, I probably have to add uh, some, some details, but I don't want to dig into details now. I just want to show that the question that we are interested in is the relation between these two variants. Uh, let us look at this uh, picture and let us imagine another picture. Uh, for example, for which uh, between group variants uh, is the same, but in group variants is much larger. Assume that I have another picture of like this. So again, this is orange. And assume that I have uh, the same means, but I have much larger variance in each group. Something like this. Uh, which picture is more convincing and um, that uh, that there is difference between groups that actually means are different which is more convincing 
this one or this one, provided that uh, these means are the same, here are and here. Yeah. Now, this one is more convincing. Everybody agree with that? No. And uh, this, is, uh, this is in fact true, because uh, here we understand that if we have large variance in each group, and we have, it, it means that we have large overall, uh, overall variance. And so this between group variance can be, uh, can be just explained by this, by this chance. So it can be that just by chance, uh, uh, these values are slightly less than these values and so on. Uh, but here we see that all groups are very compact. And uh, it allows us to assume that if we, if we see difference between, between the corresponding means, this difference has to be attributed to the actual difference between the corresponding populations. And so what we are interested in analysis of variance is uh, the relation between these two variances. In fact, uh, one way to do this, uh, this ANOVA test is to divide uh, is to divide this between group variance uh, by in group variance. And uh, this is the statistic that used in the NOVA. This is called F statistics. Uh, this is like between group variance divided by in group variance. And uh, again, uh, we have some known distribution for this F statistics uh, that is not like T distribution because uh, these variances are positive numbers, and so it is not symmetric anymore. But anyway, this is this is something known. Uh, this is something theoretically known, and we can use it uh, to construct statistical tests uh, like we dis uh, like we constructed T test. But I, uh, I'm absolutely don't want to dig into details here uh, in the construction of this test. Uh, I think that the main idea uh, that you have to understand is that uh, analysis of variance actually analyzes variances. So it compares uh, these variances, these between group variance and in group variance. And in fact, if you, if you look carefully on, on, this, on this ratio, you see that this thing, if, if you have only two groups, this thing becomes very close to t-test. Because in t-test, we compared the difference between two sample means. So something that is very close to this uh, between group variance. And uh, we divided it uh, to when we calculated this t statistics, we divided it to some value that was uh, related to, to variance in each group that corresponds to this in group variance. So basically, this is uh, this is direct uh, direct um, generalization. It can be seen as a direct generalization of t test to a case of several groups. And uh, due to the fact that we don't have any pairwise pairwise comparisons here. We have we we analyze the whole data at, at once in in one test. We don't have multiple comparison problems here. Uh, so to formalize, uh, let me say that in ANOVA, uh, you have your formal statement is like like this. Okay, let me. Replace this picture with form statement. Uh, actually, there are different versions of ANOVA. This is the simplest one. This is called uh, one way ANOVA. Um, one way means that we have only one uh, variable, like we have only color. It is possible that we have two variables. For example, if we were studying, is it true that, uh, is it true that, well, 
And not only color, but also size of the paper affects uh, the result. Then it, it would be two way and all. I'm just uh, discussing now the simplest uh, one way and all. Uh, and in this one way, and you know, well, we believe that we have uh, several examples. Uh, for example, Sample X, sample Y, and sample Z. Uh, they are not necessarily uh, of the same size. They can be of different size, at least slightly. Uh, and you believe that uh, all these uh, all these values of X that they are obtained from their old population. So uh, this is X capital, this is Y capital, this is Z capital. These are corresponding populations. So now we have three boxes with balls or more. And uh, we select values from each box. And uh, in, in this case, your new hypothesis is that uh, is that the corresponding population uh, the corresponding population means are the same. So all population means are equal to each other. And uh, your alternative is that um, basically uh, uh, alternative is just uh, H naught is not true. So some difference at least, at least. So this is this is the statement of another. Um, if we, if actually to report that there is an effect of color to the scope, we can just reject this null hypothesis. If we see difference between like blue and white, or blue and orange, or white and pink, or something else, if we see any of these differences, then yes, we can report that, uh, that color affects. Uh, and exam score. Uh, so this is uh, this is the correct test to use in this uh, color score experiment. Uh, so and here in the old uh, uh, particular uh, results. No, we have only one result. Basically, uh, and the problem with ANOVA is that it just gives you. Is it true that everything is equal or not? Uh, as is, it doesn't give you information on. If if there is difference, where this difference lies? So let us uh, uh, let us switch to R and do this test, and then uh, we will make a break. Or probably, okay, probably let us make a break and then do the test. Okay, ten minutes break. We continue. We continue in ten minutes. I forgot to, to to start the recording after the break. Sorry. Uh, okay, so we continue with uh, we continue with the whiteboard. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
And uh, my next topic is confidence intervals. Uh, and uh, on the previous uh, on the previous lessons, we discussed uh, the problem of hypothesis testing. So we have some hypothesis like. Uh, that people in St. Petersburg are taller than people in Moscow. And this is a, this hypothesis a, is a formalization of yes or no uh, question. So we have a question and we have answer like yes or no, is it true or not? And we are answering this question. Uh, but um, sometimes people are really interested in in this yes or no question. Is it true that something uh, affects something? Is it true that uh, the new drug is bad, the real air allows you to recover faster? Uh, but sometimes uh, people are interested in the actual value. Uh, so if we have a question, not like, is it true that people in St. Petersburg are taller than people in Moscow? But uh, what is um, the height of uh, citizens most? What is the average? Actually, this is the question that we uh, started uh, several classes ago. And uh, we discussed that we can uh, answer uh, to this question by uh, conducting peer research when we have a sample and uh, we find sample mean. And we can say that if our sample is large enough, then uh, then uh, the sample mean is a good approximation, a good estimate for the corresponding population. Uh, but again, uh, I want to return to the question, um, uh, which sample is large enough? Uh, when, uh, when we have, in, uh, how the size of the sample affects on um, the, the accuracy of our estimation. Uh, so we know that the sample mean uh, is an estimate of population. So for large samples, uh, the deviation of sample mean from population mean Uh, is small. Uh, but how small?
so basically what uh, I want now is to provide uh, some quantitative estimate uh, of the quality of uh, our estimate of sample of population mean. Uh, I say that uh, I have a sample of, for example, 10 uh, people in Moscow. I calculated uh, their uh, their heights, I measured their heights. And uh, I calculated uh, the corresponding sample mean. I understand that if my sample is very, very, very large, then this procedure allows me to get a good approximation, a good estimate. But I don't have a very, very, very large sample. I have my, my sample that, that I have. This is not very large. This is only 10, 10 people. And uh, anyway, can I say something meaningful about uh, the population mean from this data? This is what uh, this is. This is the question that I'm uh, uh, trying to answer. And uh, the frequency statistics that we are discussing now uh, gives me the following rather strange, to be honest, uh, answer to this question. This is. This is the confidence intervals. Uh, let me try to explain what we are doing in confidence intervals. Okay, probably I will erase this uh, question statement. And to do some formalization. So again, we have some population and we have some sample. And we have some population mean. Let me denote it by new. And uh, we have sample and we have sample mean. That is just an average of these values that I have in my sample. And uh, what are what is my dream is to provide some segment and say that. My actual value nu lies inside this segment. So I have I have some I have some point estimate and I have some segment and I say that this is that uh, my point estimate and uh, I have some precision that the actual value lies somewhere between this value and this value. And I will try to construct this interval. And this is done in the following way. So uh, uh, I will draw here the picture that uh, I don't have access to because here, uh, I, uh, I plotted the value mu that I don't know. This is the actual population mean. And uh, then uh, this is, um, this are our sample means. And I draw the distribution of this sample means. This is the usual picture that we uh, already discussed several times. And uh, now, let me draw a different axis. And uh, on this axis, uh, let me draw the actual value that I have. It can be, for example, somewhere here. here. 
This is my uh, M bar observed. Uh, and now uh, I do the following procedure. In, in fact, uh, I cannot uh, find the exact distribution uh, of this sample means because I don't know mu. But uh, what I know about this distribution is its shape. It is more or less close to a normal distribution. And I can find uh, the corresponding variance. So I, uh, I can find how wide this picture is. And uh, then I do the following thing. Uh, let me let me find values here and here symmetrical. Mm. This is mu minus s, and this is mu plus s. And I find such value s that uh, this area is 95%, for example. Uh, this is actually what we already did when we discussed two sample t test. And if, if this, uh, this area is 95%, then uh, what is this area and this area? Yes, in some there are uh, there, there are five percent, and uh, if everything is symmetric, then we have two point five uh, percent here and here. But now I'm mostly interested in in this probability, and uh, I write here ninety five percent. And uh, then uh, this this uh, value ninety five percent allows me to find this S. If I believe that I know the shape of this curve up to the shift that depends on mu. Uh, I know of, then I can find this value S, right? Because even if mu is not here, but here, if I just shift this picture, a value of S uh, will be the same because it is the difference between these two points. And this difference depends not on mu, but it depends on the variance of this distribution of how wide it, it, it is. Um, then I can find this value S. And then I can do the following thing. I can draw a segment around this point X bar observed. And uh, this segment will be uh, from X bar observed minus S to X bar observed plus S. This is my segment. <coughs> and now my question is the following. Uh, let us assume that I repeat the same procedure. Okay, I have the same population. This is fixed. And I repeat uh, the the following procedure a lot of times. I sample new population. From this population, I find uh, the corresponding uh, X bar. And I draw uh, a segment of this size around this point. And I repeat it 10,000 times. Uh, my question is, how often this point mill uh, we all belong to this segment. So, uh, what is what is uh, the probability? Uh, that mu 
lies inside of this segment. X bar. X bar minus S. X bar plus S. So uh, X bar is distributed according to this distribution. Um, we can have points here, 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 but they are distributed according to this distribution. And uh, so sometimes it is possible that we draw the segment too far from this mu. It doesn't contain mu. Sometimes it do contains mu. Uh, so my question is, what is the probability that this segment contains mu with our construction? So let me recall what uh, this what this curve symbolizes. Uh, this curve uh, shows us the distribution of uh, these values x bar. So if we repeat this is the repeat sampling, we will get different x bars, and we uh, assume that we repeated it uh, a lot of times, like uh, ten thousand times, and then uh, we plotted a lot of uh, a lot of x bars on this line and then we plotted the corresponding histogram so this this curve is like the histogram that we plotted so basically uh, area under this curve shows you the probability so if if i choose any uh, if i choose any segment on, uh, under this curve the corresponding area is probability that uh, x bar under this Repeating procedure lies in the corresponding uh, in the corresponding interval. So, my question is, uh, what is the probability to what is the probability that mu lies inside this inside this interval? Or probably better to say, what is the probability that this segment covers this mu? Because what changes from one experiment to another experiment is uh, this segment. Mu is just fixed now. I want to note that this event that mu lies inside this inside this segment uh, is the same as um distance between mu and x bar is less than s right if mu lies in this segment then it means that the distance between mu and uh, x bar is less than s okay Hmm? Uh, no, it can be larger than mu. Uh, so uh, uh, this this x bar can be can be here, can be here. This is why I say distance, but not difference. Distance is just absolute value of difference. Yes, and here, so here, uh, it's either, either it's the same distance or two s. Like between uh, in the our sample and in the interval. Uh, this S and this S are the same, uh, the same values. Because this is the construction. We we, we chose here uh, the value of S uh, when we constructed this interval. We chose it from this picture. So then the intervals are intervals, yes. The yes, the length of this interval is the same as the length of this interval, correct? And basically, we can restate this uh, condition in the following way. Uh, this is, I can just uh, swap this mu and x bar and say that this is the same condition as that x lies uh, in the segment from 
mu minus s to mu plus s. Uh, so we, in this way, we see that this is uh, symmetric, and uh, this uh, this condition returns us to this picture. So, what is the probability of this event? Sure, this is because we choose S in this exactly in this way. We choose S such that this the probability that x bar lies in, in, in this segment is 95%. Okay? Everybody agree? Uh, so, basically, we constructed uh, a, a, a very nice thing. We constructed an interval uh, such that probability that this interval contains the value that we are interested in, the actual population mean, is 95%. It is rather large. So probability that mu is outside of this segment is rather small. Uh, and this is, uh, this is why these things, these confidence intervals are actually used. Um, so basically, this is when you report this confidence interval, you say that, okay, your point estimate is here, but the possible interval is here, but it does not mean that you're absolutely sure that um, your value that you're estimating in this interval, but the probability that it is also that it is outside is somewhere small. The interpretation of this confidence interval is tricky because when you have the actual data and you calculated this uh, this interval, basically you don't have any probability anymore. The probability uh, actually this is this is the problem of all frequentistic statistics. The probability appears from this imaginary experiment that you repeat the research that you do uh, ten thousand times. Like you have 10,000 independent laboratories and they all do their research uh, with the same, with the same population using the same uh, technique, uh, using the same uh, analytic tools. And they, of course, due to, due to sampling errors, they, uh, you know, they obtain slightly different results. And uh, if you have, for example, 10,000 independent labs, and each lab will provide their own confidence interval for the same value mu, then 95% um, of these labs will be correct. And 5% of these labs will be incorrect. They will provide your an interval, for example, one lab can, can be unlikely enough to get uh, their exit here. And they will provide your this interval that doesn't contain this new. Uh, so, in fact, nobody uh, do this 10,000 replications of each study. Uh, but, well, this is a kind of philosophical question on how to uh, what to think about this confidence interval, but um, in any case, uh, people extensively use this, uh, this confidence intervals, and um, this is just the current industry standard. Uh, when you report your estimate of some value, you also report confidence interval for this estimate. Otherwise, it doesn't count, because probably uh, you, you found some estimate, but the confidence interval is too large and you just don't have enough information to be useful. And uh, if, your, if your confidence interval is small, then uh, you probably have some meaningful information about the value you are estimating. So uh, are there questions so far about these confidence intervals? But it's 
Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember. I remember that picture. Yeah, in fact, uh, in this uh, in this story again, I simplified things a little bit. Uh, in fact, I said that we can find this S. Uh, this S uh, is related to uh, to the corresponding population mean. It can be calculated from the population mean. In fact, uh, this S uh, can be calculated uh, by dividing population mean by square root of number of elements in your sample and multiplying by some constant that depends on this 95%. Uh, but uh, the problem is that we don't know this population mean. We are estimating this population mean from uh, the sample mean. And again, as usual in this science, it is possible that your sample, again, just by chance, uh, has smaller uh, variance than uh, your population. It is possible that your elements in your sample are just too similar to each other, just by chance, just because, just because you did, uh, you recruited people and all of them are, I don't know, all of them play basketball and this is just makes them to be, uh, so decreases their, uh, their variance, for example, in some, in some regards. And, um, and it is, it, it means that when you do this replicates of this study, you don't have uh, equal, equally sized uh, segments uh, just shifted to the right or to the left. In fact, you have uh, segments of different, of different length. But again, uh, to, uh, in defense of confidence interval, I can say that uh, anyway, to estimate uh, the precision of your estimation of your, of, of your estimation of me, you have to know this population mean. You don't have any other information to estimate it other than sample mean. And if your sample is large enough, then you have pretty good estimate of, of uh, population mean. And it is a good idea to report it anyway, because okay, uh, I understand that it is also a random variable, but Anyway, uh, it contains information on the precision of your of your of your estimates. Because if uh, if a confidence interval is small, okay, it is possible that it is small due to sampling error. But again, it is not very well. Uh, it is not a, it is not highly likely. It is it is it is unlikely that the difference is large. Uh, in, in fact, let me show you uh, some nice visual demonstration of these confidence intervals. Uh, so I can. Oops. Okay. Can you turn on the mic, please? Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, so uh, in this uh, in this visualization, we have ah uh, okay. Um, another idea is to turn on uh, to turn to turn on projector. Uh, so we are generating a lot of uh, samples, and for each sample we find a confidence interval. And uh, the true population mean uh, is this vertical line; it is zero. And uh, uh, each blue dot uh, is a corresponding sample mean, and uh, this is the corresponding confidence interval. And indeed, we see that there are wide confidence intervals and there are narrow confidence intervals. And uh, the only thing that um, that actually uh, holds is that uh, we have 95% of generated confidence interval to cover uh, the population mean. You see that this uh, red, confidence intervals that do not cover the population mean that they are really rare. But yes, it is true that to some extent, uh, for example, width of the corresponding confidence interval does not guarantee, uh, for example, if, if, the if the corresponding interval is small, it does not guarantee that we have a good approximation. It's possible to have better approximation. But, um, this is uh, a sample size of five. Uh, let us increase sample size. How do you think what happens with confidence intervals? What happens with sample means and with confidence intervals if I increase sample size? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, this, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the main question. Uh, will they become narrower or wider? confidence intervals if we increase sample size hmm? narrower. narrower why why they become narrower mm -hmm. yeah in fact what happens if you what happens if you increase sample size Okay, let us increase it. I can, it was five, I will do it 100. Um, when we increase sample size, uh, our sample means uh, become closer to the population mean. This is what we usually expect. The larger sample we have, the, the, the closer, uh, sample means to population means. And as a corollary, we can decrease the size of, uh, of our confidence intervals to and, and maintain uh, the, same, uh, the same relation that 95% uh, of them covers uh, the true population means. So you see that uh, the size of confidence intervals decreased. And um, despite that fact, uh, again, uh, our red confidence intervals that do not cover the actual sample mean, uh, they are not, they present rather rarely. Only here, here, so this is 95% of them. Uh, so basically it means that the size of confidence interval contains information on the sample on the sample size. Uh, another thing that we can tweak here is uh, we can tweak uh, we can tweak confidence level. Confidence level is the value that that was 95%. Uh, how do you think what happens if I change uh, confidence level from 95% to 
if I increase confidence level? What happens with uh, confidence intervals length? More, more intervals that are red, but we maintain, uh, we maintain the same, uh, we maintain their, uh, their proportion. Uh, this is, this is uh, the construction. By construction, we guarantee that only 5% uh, of intervals are red, only five. Ah, sorry, um, so, uh, sorry. We maintain it if we keep the same uh, the same confidence uh, the same confidence level, but what happens if we have ninety nine percent confidence level? It means that only one percent uh, should be red. Uh, how to achieve this? So what should we do with our confidence intervals to achieve ninety nine percent confidence level? Should we make them smaller or larger? Larger, why larger? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. If if I if I increase it, uh, we have larger confidence intervals because the larger confidence interval, the more probability for it to cover to cover population mean. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, if I if I have to to increase my confidence. I have to be more cautious uh, and, and say that, okay, uh, I have a prediction, but this prediction is from here to here. Yeah? Uh, I can predict, uh, I can predict, predict weather with very good confidence. I, I, I'm absolutely confident with 99% confidence that the weather tomorrow will be from minus 50 degrees of Celsius to plus 50 uh, degrees of Celsius. And I'm sure that I will not be mistaken, but if I want, uh, if, um, so this, if, if I want this, this confidence, I have to, I have to increase the length of confidence intervals. But people, people are usually use 95% uh, confidence intervals and this is actually related to 5% of uh, significance level in hypothesis testing. Uh, this is a similar thing. Uh, so this is, this is about confidence intervals. And uh, let me show you how to find confidence interval in R. In fact, uh, you can do it in two ways. Um, Okay, I already have some data set and let us just find the confidence interval for this variable score, just not to load any other data set. Uh, so to find, to find confidence interval, I have to find, um, first I have to find a standard deviation of my data. And this can be done by this function SD. Uh, so we have that standard deviation of my data is 20. Uh, then uh, I have to find uh, the deviation of possible sample means. Uh, there is a formula that says that uh, sample When we discussed uh, central limit theorem, we discussed that deviation of uh, deviation of sample mean 
is equal to deviation uh, in, in your population divided by square root of n. So uh, square root, so this thing is called standard error of mean. And this is standard deviation of data divided by square root of len our data set. Oh, this is 1.32. Um, actually, uh, it is easier to confuse these two, these two values. Uh, so this is a standard deviation of data. So it says how different are, uh, how different are our, our students, how, to which extent uh, their scores are different. And uh, this value, standard error of mean, is different. It is not about uh, the students themselves. Uh, this uh, is like uh, I have 1,000 student groups. In each student group, I found uh, I found uh, the corresponding um, sample mean. And then I'm asking uh, of how different are these standard uh, are these are these uh, means, and uh, this thing depends on the size of the group. It depends on how different students are, but also it depends on the size of the group. Uh, and this is why uh, this is why this is completely different number. But uh, it is very important number because it allows you to approximately estimate the precision of your of your uh, uh, of your sample mean. Uh, in fact, to get the confidence interval, to get the number s that uh, we discussed there, I can multiply uh, this s to the error mean by a magic number one dot. 96. Uh, here, 1.96 is related to 95%. Uh, for different confidence level, A will be different. Uh, this is actually a quantile of normal distribution. But. And then uh, our confidence interval is just mean of so from here to here. So oh, this is our confidence interval. Uh, mean value is 38 and confidence interval from 35 and four to Forty at at n six. Basically, it means that with my group, if I believe that my group is a representative sample from some much much larger population, uh, then uh, I can more or less say that the corresponding population mean lies somewhere between these two numbers.
more or less with all um, taking into account all events of Damian that confidence intervals show nothing. But anyway, they show something. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the procedure that uh, we can do by hands. And in fact, it is uh, useful to remember this procedure because uh, sometimes in the literature, you will get not confidence interval, but this standard error of mean. And not in literature, in, in our output in some fields, uh, you are usually have this, uh, this thing, standard error. And uh, so it is a good habit to multiply it by approximately two and to get uh, the corresponding confidence interval in your head. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we can avoid these calculations and use function t-test because t-test not only reports uh, the p-value, but it also reports confidence intervals. And if you, if you do one sample t-test, and uh, you do not provide any alternative, and you do not provide any, um, any information about the true mean. This p-value is not very informative for us, but uh, we are interested in this 95% confidence interval. You see that it is from 35 to 40 and a bit more. And it is pretty close to the values that we are obtained um, by hands. 35.43 and we have 35.44. Yeah, pretty good. Uh, pretty good correspondence with our result. Uh, the result is not exactly the same because uh, the, in t-test they use a bit different distribution. This is the difference between uh, normal distribution and t-distribution. Uh, but you see that with the amount of data that we have, uh, and we have 260 uh, elements in our sample or so, you see the difference between uh, our confidence interval that was calculated using normal distribution, because this value of no, nine, no, this, this value came from normal distribution. Uh, we see that the difference is really small. So basically you can, you can just put normal distribution and it will work. Okay, and so we have, now we have this confidence intervals, I think on the, uh, on the next classes, we will discuss how to visualize these confidence intervals because it is sort of useful. Uh, technique when you report not only the values that you have but also but also uh, the corresponding the corresponding precisions. Are there any questions?